Genesis 10, 1 through chapter 11, verse 9. All scripture is profitable for our souls, even if this one may be a gauntlet to read uh, out loud. Uh, If you'll stand for the reading. Genesis, beginning at chapter 10, verse 1. (coughs) This is God's word. These are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Sons were born to them after the flood. The sons of Japheth, Gomer, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshach, and Tiras. The sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz, Riphoth, and Tagamara. <clears throat> the sons of Javan, Elisha, Tarshish, Kittim, Dodanim. From these, the coastland peoples spread in their lands, each with his own language by their clans In their nations, the sons of Ham, Cush, Egypt, Put, and Canaan, the sons of Cush, Seba, Havilah, Sebta, Rama, and Sabtika, the sons of Rama, Sheva, and Dadan, Cush fathered Nimrod, he was the first on earth to be a mighty man. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Erech, Echad, and Kalna, in the land of Shinar. From that land, he went into Assyria and built Nineveh, Rehoboth, Er, Kala, and Rezin, between Nineveh and Kala. That is the great city. Egypt fathered Ludden, Anamim, Lehabim, Naphtahum, Patrasim, Kalashum, from whom the Philistines came, and Kaphtarim. Canaan fathered Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth, And the Jebusites, the Amorites, and the Girgashites, the Hivites, the Archites, the Sinites, the Arvidites, the Zemorites, and the Hamathites. Afterward, the clans of the Canaanites dispersed, and the territory of the Canaanites extended from Sidon in the direction of Gerar, as far as Gaza, and in the direction of Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, and Zeboim, as far as Lasha. These are the sons of Ham, by their clans, their languages, their lands, and nations. To Shem also, the father of all the children of Aver, the elder brother of Japheth, children were born. The sons of Shem, Elam, Asher, Archipashaban, Lud, and Aram. The sons of Aram, Uz, Hul, Gaither, and Mash. Arpachashad fathered Selah, and Selah fathered Aver. To Aver were born two sons. The name of the one was Peleg, for in his days the earth was divided. And his brother's name was Joktan. Joktan fathered Almodad, Shelef, Parmazaveth, Jerah, Hadaram, Uzal, Dikla, Obal, Abimael, Sheva, Ophir, Havilah, and Johab. All these were the sons of Joktan. The territory in which they lived extended from Mesha in the direction of Safar to the hill country of the east. These are the sons of Shem. 
by their clans, their languages, their lands, and their nations. These are the clans of the sons of Noah, according to their genealogies, in their nations, and from these the nations spread abroad on the earth after the flood. Now, the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they have all one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there, the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God abides forever. By his grace and mercy, may it be preached for you. You may be seated. And as we, thank you, as we come to consider this portion of God's word, let us pray for his help. Almighty God, we come to this Uh, Next section of Genesis where we find a a new chapter, a new generation uh, described before us. And as we consider uh, what this generation did in the history of earth, um, and specifically as history presses towards consideration of your people, uh, might we um, benefit from considering what it is they tried to do. And how you responded. And so might we store up in our hearts where true greatness may be found. That is in giving you glory. Rather than striving to have it for ourselves. Overcome the deficiencies of the preacher. They are many. And bless the reading and the preaching of your holy word. Bring forth fruit in our hearts that we might love you more, that we would serve you better. And we ask it for Christ's sake. Amen. We have a phrase in the South that someone has gotten too big for his britches. And it's about how we can become swollen of sorts so that the places where we belong no longer have room for us. It's about conceit. And self-importance when we come to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think. It's a rebuke to those who need to be put back in their place to recover a a humble and realistic self-perception. In Genesis 10, 1, all the way through 11, 9, uh, we find an account of people getting too big for their britches. It tells the story of humanity's uh, increasing pride and hubris as we continue to rebel against the Lord in in new levels of sin. And this event shows the human impulse to try to uh, exalt ourselves above God. It shows how we so quickly build idols and, and ultimately We most idolize ourselves. Genesis, though, as a whole, is a book about our communion with God. It describes the 
blessed beginnings of our relationship with God, both as we we see it in creation and by grace. God made us for this purpose of, of knowing him, glorifying him and enjoying him. And so by creation, we were meant for communion with God. But we rebelled against him. And and we fell short of that reason for which we were made. Despite our sin, in that way and as it grew, God renewed our communion for which we were made, renewed our communion with him by grace. And so in God's mercy, we are put back into a good relationship with God. Whereas the first few chapters of Genesis describe the very beginning of our relationship with God, a a way of relating to him that we no longer know after sin. The, The rest of the book of Genesis describes the blessed beginnings of how we know God in grace. It begins the story way back then, the story that is still ongoing. It begins the story of how God is kind to sinners, despite what we deserve. And now we might easily forget, because we have um, chapter divisions and verse divisions that, that help us navigate through the material in this book, we might easily forget that Genesis, as the Holy Spirit inspired it through Moses, has its own original Chapter division, something that predated our insertion of these numerical headings to to help us keep track, have reference points, right? Uh, In Genesis, those original chapters are marked with this phrase in the generations of or these are the generations of. So um, we, we have another one here. We're at the fourth one. We had we had one in chapter two. We had one in chapter Five. We had one in chapter six. And here we come to chapter four, or at least the fourth section. Maybe that's the better way to put it to avoid confusion that I've probably already created. The, we come to the fourth section. These are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham and Japheth. And this section focuses on how humanity repopulated after the flood and explains the course that they took. It explains how all the nations of the earth came from these sons of of Noah. And although this section of Genesis is is because we've got the whole of it before. I mean, 1110 is going to pick up at the fifth section. These are the generations of Shem. Uh, we, this this section focuses uh, or is relatively short in the running narrative of Genesis unfolding so- story. And nonetheless, it moves forward our understanding of humanity's condition and how we came to be in the place that even we find ourselves today. And this portion sets before us two issues. This fourth, sec- fourth section 10 uh, in the first bit of chapter 11 sets before us two issues. Um, First, chapter 10 is what has been called the table of nations. It outlines how the major nations, um, at least as they knew as they knew them uh, and and labeled them in Moses's time. It outlines how the major nations came from Noah's sons and how those nations related to members of that family, of Noah's family. And second, we read of the Tower of Babel. And and we will think about how those two sections relate to one another as as we work through this material. We find, however, a challenge for our discipleship in that it asks us to consider why humanity is so divided. And how we fit into that picture. Why is humanity so divided? And how do we fit into that picture? Why are we at odds with one another? The main point is that greatness cannot be found in our sin. Greatness 
cannot be found in our sin. And our three points to help us think through that are the table, the tower, and the tongues. The table, the tower, the tongues. First, let's think together about the table. In chapter 10, we have uh, this table of nations. It's the outline, right? You know, you, uh, you get the, your risk game board out and, and you see all the nations outlined in front of you. And this is kind of the biblical risk game board. It outlines the whole of the nations, which is the genealogy of how various people groups descended from Noah's sons. And we should remember a few things about genealogies and how they fit uh, in, in the Bible. Though They're not just there to give you a, a running set of facts. It, they are a set of facts, but God is interested in teaching us something uh, through genealogies. They have a purpose. Uh, and first, genealogies are ways that Scripture quickly summarizes big chunks of time to move the narrative forward. We would, we would get bogged down uh, in the details that weren't pertinent to what God understood his people needed to know if he gave us full stories about all these people. And so he gave us a genealogy. Bam. This gets you to the next point that you need to have in your awareness. G- Genesis 10 condenses a lot of time and a lot of human expansion into a relatively short space because ultimately this section serves to bridge the gap to get us well from this flood event to the next major figure in the story of redemptive history, namely Abraham. That's, this is a, a transitional section, genealogy. Second... Genealogies also mark major developments as God keeps his promises in history. And hence we need to consider how, how this, na- this table of nations is arranged. It reverses, right? Usually Noah's sons are listed Shem, Ham, and Japheth. This reverses that order. And we ought to ask why. Why? The table moves from Japheth to Ham to Shem because it is narrowing towards its focal point. The thing that is going to occupy our attention as we move forward. Right? So it's, it's sort of giving you information that's good and, and useful and then setting it aside. One well-known theologian, at least for the OPC... Um, Gerhardus Voss, who taught at Princeton Seminary back when Princeton was good, um, ref- the seminary at least, um, referred to Genesis 10 as the genealogy of redemption. The genealogy of redemption. Because although many of these nations fall out of the biblical story, you know, they, they, they blur out of our attention, God has recorded them. So that we remember his purpose, as, as Voss put it, to eventually, right, as the biblical story will continue until the point where we find ourselves, God's purpose to re-enclose them in the sacred circle. We need to know who these people were, because at some point, God is going to deal with them again and bring and at least open the door for them to be back amongst his people. And we will see that. By the end of our reflections today. And so the the table moves from what is less important to the story of salvation to what is most important. And we see in verse 5 the relevance of Japheth's descent. So we're just going to grab hold of, okay, each section. What's what's, uh, important about each section rather than... I, 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 I may have listened to a few sermons on this passage this week to see what other people managed to do with this. And, and a lot of them de- detailed, uh, well, how each of these names results in, in nations that you know today. I'm not going, maybe you want that, but I'm not going to do that. <laughs> um, instead, what I want to do is try to grab hold of what, what is significant about each line 
you've got three lines and just, okay, what's the relevance for each chunk? And in verse 5, we see the relevance of Japheth's descendants. For from these, the coastland peoples spread in their lands, each with his own language by their clans in their nations. These are the, the people far away. These are, are the, the Gentiles, right, who do not, the, the Gentiles who do not play a serious role in the story of God's people. And that's why they're first. They're sort of most removed from where the storyline of the Bible goes. And Ham comes next and will feature at points in the biblical narrative God's people. N- note some of the nations that appear in this lineage, though. Egypt, Canaan, Babel, Assyria, the Philistines. When you sort of get to the nub of this, we, we start to see that these were the famed enemies of God's people. These nations will show up again and again as those who are against the people of God. Ham's line is still that cursed line showing their, showing their cursed nature in pursuing God's people to harm them. And so we come, lastly, to Shem's line. This line will be the family that continues God's saving promise. We come to Shem last because this family will be the focal point for the majority of biblical history. Now, what have we learned so far from that? We see how God's purposes continue even as humanity grows in different directions. The the presence of Shem's line shows uh, through the outline of these genealogies that, that God's commitment to save those whom he has chosen, God's commitment to save them, cannot be defeated. The table displays God's power to make sure His grace remains present to keep His people close to Him. Shows God's power to make sure His grace remains present to keep His people close to Him. And that brings us to our second point, the tower. The other part uh, of this installment about Noah's son, this fourth section, the generations of Noah's son, the other part of this installment uh, shows how human sin increases and how God opposes sin. It also shows God's astounding mercy. Before we see that, though, or I guess in order to see that, we need to, we need to notice how the, the record of this event of the Tower of Babel relates to that table of, of nations. It's easy, I, you know, from standard operating procedure as we read things is, is to think, okay, well, we've got this, we've got chapter 10, and now the next thing that happens in order, following that is chapter 11. And that's not exactly how this works um, in this instance. So notice there uh, in chapter 11, verse 1. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And so we have, we have a note there at the start of this story that the whole of the human race spoke the same tongue. But we might easily overlook, you know, grabbing hold of that, we might have easily overlooked a surprising note repeated throughout chapter 10 at the end of each uh, chunk of the genealogy. So 10-5. Um, I'm just going to grab hold. There's three. I'm going to grab hold uh, of them. 
10, 5, the coastland peoples spread in their lands, each with his own language by their clans and their nations. 10, 20, these are the sons of Ham by their clans, their languages, their lands and their nations. 1031, these are the, you can probably guess where this is going. <laughs> these are the sons of Shem, by their clans, their languages, their lands, and their nations. So at the beginning of the Tower of Babel, everybody has one language. But this table of nations says, well, actually, all of these, by the time we're at the end of it, speak all their own languages. And to bring this tension together, we come to see that chapter 11's story of the Tower of Babel, before which all humanity spoke the same language, explains this event, explains how we came to have that fragmented table of nations, everyone with their own individual tongue. This is the event that explains why chapter 10 is there as we have it. So check uh, chapter 10, verse 25 to to Aver. um, Now, okay, to to peel back the to look under the hood, so to speak, um, from this name, we get the word Hebrew. So um, there there isn't really H's in you don't care about this. Never mind. Um, (laughs) uh, To Aver uh, were born two sons, The, the name of the one son was Peleg, for in his days the earth was divided, and his brother's name was Joktan. So the tragic event of Babel fits right there in Peleg's lifetime and is the reason why the peoples of earth are disparate and and struggle to communicate with each other even now. It's, It's right there in the timeline. And the tower shows the hubris of humanity as, um, as this then united people came together to glorify themselves rather than God. 11 verse 4. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens and let us make a name for ourselves lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. They wanted to build their own way right into heaven through earthly accomplishments so that their name would stand and they wouldn't have to be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth as God had commanded. Instead, we can stay right here. They could stay in this plain in Shinar and just climb their staircase right into the throne room of God. And and despite how these sinners strove for their own glory by building their own way into heaven, the, the irony of God's true relation to their work is plain there in verse 5. They're trying to build their way into heaven, right? And they thought, we're almost there. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. Now, of course, God can see all things everywhere because he is present everywhere. He doesn't have to learn things. The biblical description here, though, aims to mock the foolishness of this sin. Although man thought they had built a tower high enough to to poke through the floor of heaven, the reality is that they were so far off that God had to come down just to see man's efforts to build a tower that they thought was poking its way into God's heaven. And we see how God's greatness For them, for us, shows our sinful efforts at self-exaltation to be so pathetic. Every attempt that we make to exalt ourselves, 
to the Lord, above the Lord. It's ridiculous. Because God transcends the best that we could ever do. And ironically, they did acquire a name for themselves. Babel. And yet, it's not a name for their exaltation. It's a name related to bringing further curse upon the whole world rather than related to any triumph. And the curse that came was that God divided the languages so that we could not communicate with one another. And yet, yet, even in that curse, we find an aspect of mercy. How so? Well, notice, notice what, uh, in verse 6, what God says. Behold, they are one people, and they have all one language, and this, namely, namely, this sin, right? This sin is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Now, here, here's the thing. When you ground that statement in the context of, you know, the event that's happening, God didn't mean that they would actually be able to build their way into heaven. He didn't mean that they would be able to accomplish any supernatural feat if he did not stop them. Rather, he meant that there would be no limit on the on the heinousness of sin that they could perform. If they get away with this, no sin would be left impossible for them. Left unchecked, humanity's sin would spiral wildly out of control as it had done before the flood. And so, God mercifully divided our language to keep sin upon the earth in check. And that itself is a mercy. I, I mean, you like, well, I was going to say you may, but you likely have things about uh, your society that you wish were different because you, you think that they are corrupt. And we just say, but imagine, had God not checked our propensity for sin. But imagine. He protected humanity, which remains today. He, in a degree, right? Not from sin entirely, but He protected humanity from our trajectory of ending up with a society fulfilled or filled only with sin. Even at this early period, millennia ago, God spared us from ourselves. Second, um, left unchecked. So, so um, you know, you know, first is it's bad. It, it would have been bad had sin itself become that prevailing. But second, on top of that. Left unchecked, our sin to that scale would have warranted another flood scale judgment. And so, God, in a, by scattering the nations, God enabled the world to continue long enough for the plan of redemption to unfold, where after scattering those people, He could bring us back through salvation. Although this event seems grandiose and far removed, it represents an impulse that we all have to work for our own pride. Would we not all love to be exalted? Would we not love to be center stage of the world and to have achieved everything great on the human stage? The tower here teaches us about our sin of wanting to make a name for ourselves. 
And that brings us to our final point, the tongues. The curse rolled out at Babel was to divide and disperse all humanity by confusing our language. We could no longer understand one another. And yet, in Christ, God, by grace, brings people back together. In, which is a, yeah, has its own application for once we are back together, how we ought to treat one another, doesn't it? We have been dispersed and divided, and redemption is about tying us together. And here we are, tied into one people, and we ought to act like it. In Acts 2, we read, uh, we read, uh, in fact, uh, of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the church after Christ had ascended. And, And as the Spirit came in this new measure... He was equipping the church to bring the nations back together. And and what happened as he was equipping them for that? Well, the apostles spoke in tongues. And, And people from all sorts of places understood what was being said. And as the church would go forth, God was rolling back the curse of Babel by bringing the nations back together so that we would be bound together not in sin, but in the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the thing that ties cursed peoples back together. It's the Lord Jesus and His work for us. The tongues of Pentecost show that God is sending grace throughout creation to reconcile sinners to himself as he brings them into his one nation, the church. It's okay, well, it's well and good to see that God was rolling back that curse of Babel and continues to do so as he brings people from every tribe, tongue, and nation into his one people. Okay, why can that curse be reversed? Although God came down to earth at Babel to curse sinners, there was another time that God came down to earth to rescue us. As those at Babel sought to build their own name, God the Son came down in our nature, becoming incarnate, and carried each one of our names to the cross. We wanted exaltation. But Christ stood in our place, bearing your name in humiliation. Jesus Christ has endured the penalty for the whole curse of our sin. The curse is rolled back because Christ has paid for our sin. In Christ, we are forgiven. And we are guaranteed access into that kingdom where all the nations will be gathered. And we will all understand together what Christ says to us. As he welcomes us into glory for all who would trust in him and what he has done for us. Let's pray. Father God, we hope that we might be unified. As you are in the process of bringing the nations back together, the nations that you have scattered In this curse of Babel, you are bringing, you are reuniting people who were once divided, reuniting us in Christ. And so might we learn to turn away from our impulse to self-exaltation. And might we do all that we can to fight against division as well. Might, Might we learn... 
what it means to set aside the things that would divide us so that, in fact, we would treasure anew what it means to be united because of what Christ has done. Help us, O Lord, that we might treasure up our unity, that we might treasure up being reconciled to you, and that we might treasure up being reconciled to one another as well, and that we might walk well in light of it. We pray that in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen.